Filmed by a police officer's body camera from behind a riot shield. This is County Road in Liverpool on Saturday night. What's the flames? What's the flames? During a weekend when violence spread from place to place, here, the weapons of choice were fire and fireworks. Even a library with a food bank and community hub inside were smashed into, then torched. With missiles still coming, police arrest a rioter who's armed with a kosh. At 69, William Nelson Morgan had no previous convictions. Tonight, he's in jail. Your advancing years plainly did not prevent you from playing an active part at the disturbance on County Road. You were a part of a crowd of about 100 people who were running amok. The judge, who so far this week has jailed five men for rioting, condemned their actions, and also those of others who, he said, used the events of last week in Southport to sow division and hate. The people doing all of this that weren't exercising some right to freedom of expression or lawful protest, but rather that they were exploiting the anguish of others, either to further their own twisted ideology or, more likely, as an excuse simply for vandalism, intimidation and violence. They are criminals. The longest sentence so far was for this man, Derek Drummond. As he was jailed for three years, body cam footage was played in court, showing him attacking police in Southport last week. And with cases being fast-tracked, people who were part of riots in Plymouth, Bolton and Hartlepool have also already been convicted and jailed. And more arrests too, with police raids in Washington near Sunderland and in South London this morning. In all, in just over a week, around 500 people have been arrested. The youngest believed to be 11 years old. These are criminal thugs. Any suggestion they're patriots or they've got a cause that they're protesting about is nonsense. They're criminals and, frankly, most of them are going to be charged with violent disorder and most of them are going to be going to prison for a few years. In parts of Belfast, more street clashes last night. An anti-immigration protest at the weekend was followed by days of violent disorder and a series of racist attacks. The PSNI has asked for more than 100 police officers to be sent from Scotland next week. And with fears rising, today, the Northern Ireland Assembly was recalled. There is no place in our society for racism in any of its forms. And the racist attacks on people, on businesses and homes are absolutely wrong. They are ha and have created such a deep fear, a fear that I think perhaps none of us have ever seen before right out there among uh, many parts of our community. In most places last night, with a show of force by police and huge numbers of anti-racism protesters, the night passed without fears of yet more violence being realised. In the hours before, in Liverpool and dozens of other places, there have been warnings about possible disorder. Without knowing exactly why that didn't happen, it's hard to predict what will happen next. And there's been a new development in the police crackdown against false information spread online that led up to the violent disorder we've seen over the last week. Earlier today, Cheshire police arrested a 55-year-old woman from near Chester in relation to a social media post containing inaccurate information about the identity of the Southport attacker. She is being held in custody on suspicion of publishing written material to stir up racial hatred and false communications. A day after the attack, Merseyside police were forced to release a statement that an incorrect identity of the suspect was being shared on social media. Now over to Matt. Thanks, Chris. Well, earlier today, Sir Keir Starmer visited a mosque in the West Midlands where he promised that the government would reflect on the events of last night and give the necessary reassurance to communities anxious about the extent of the disorder. Well, our community's editor, Darsha Sonny, has been speaking to some of those who were there and finding out what local people made of the Prime Minister's visit. She joins us now. Darshna, over to you. 
Well, Matt, the Prime Minister said that there'll be no let-up in the police response to the disorder. And he chose to, came, to come here to this community centre and mosque in Solihull. We're on the outskirts of Birmingham and on Sunday there was an EDL march through this town. In response, hundreds of young Muslim men came out. They blocked the whole of this road. They were chanting different slogans themselves. They said they had come out to defend this mosque. And there was a concern for a while that the two groups would clash. Now, the Prime Minister said today he wanted to hear from the community about how they felt about what had happened. And it's interesting politically that he chose to visit a mosque, particularly given Labour's relationship with some in the Muslim community over issues such as Gaza. While many here welcomed his visit, I found today that others were slightly more sceptical. The communities themselves, I think, have shown um, who we really are um, as communities and as a country, particularly last night. The Prime Minister said he came to listen and understand their concerns, and in the last week there have been plenty of those. This community centre and mosque is in Solihull, a town on the outskirts of Birmingham, where on Sunday they had a rather more unwelcome visit. Save our kids! Save our kids! A far-right gathering which forced the closure of shops and businesses. The first priority is safety and security of our communities. Anybody involving themselves in disorder, whatever they claim as their motive, will feel the full force of the law. It's important I repeat that. So the Prime Minister was here this morning? Yeah, this is our Solihull hub, uh, mosque and community centre. And uh, yeah, we had a good visit, a uh, frank exchange. Jahangir Malik says that frank exchange included a discussion about the role of politicians and the media in the run-up to last week's events. Were you hurt as a British Muslim by some of the slogans that you heard chanted on our streets? I've been hurt as a British Muslim for quite some time, so, you know, it's nothing new. This is nothing new, uh, this is... That's quite sad. You know, it is sad. It's the reality of that we live in. Politicians, media, spokesmen, commentators, all of the rest of it haven't helped. The fact that there was an attack and immediately it was attributed to a Muslim to which this response took place, I mean, that's saying something, isn't it? Really, that says, that says all of what our problem is. Mohammed Isak also met the Prime Minister, but for his generation, there was more scepticism about the visit, particularly after issues including Gaza. Was it important for the Prime Minister to visit a masjid, a mosque? We have disenfranchised communities as a whole. Certain classes within our society are feeling like they're not heard and there's a, a, a disconnect for, with the government. The men say these generational differences were evident on Sunday in what happened in response to the EDL march. Hundreds of young Muslims turned up, they said, to defend the mosque. But there was a concern things would escalate and Mr Malik and others tried to get them to go home. One of the things I realised on that night I didn't have as much influence over those young people as I thought I had. And I have to recognise one's limitation. That's very interesting. That's really important. We might sit there and say, I'm a community leader and I, everybody does what I say. It doesn't work like that. The younger people have their own understanding as I guess I would have had 30, 40 years ago. But many young people believe they helped see off the threat of the far right, just as they did across England last night. This is what happened in Walthamstow. Thousands of anti-racism protesters took to the streets, forming human shields around asylum advice centres and hotels. And these were the scenes in Brighton. The Prime Minister said today it was the threat of prison and swift justice that stopped further riots. The police are now looking ahead to threatened marches this weekend. But at the hub, they say they worry about the longer term. The fear is the crisis and the interest goes away and then we go back into our own worlds and we start living separate lives again. Words won't compensate. You see, it has to be action. They say they'll be looking to the Prime Minister for that action in the weeks and months ahead. Well, earlier I spoke to the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, who was taking part in an anti-racism workshop organised by Chelsea Football Club. And I began by asking him what he thinks the lesson is from the last week of unrest. It's really important to explain to citizens uh, what's really happening, why uh, you, you have difficulty getting decent health care, why you, you can't get your kids decent education in, this, in the local school, why there's a problem with affordable uh, 
housing and why have things suddenly gone up? Now, some politicians across the country, uh, MPs indeed, people aspiring to be leaders of political parties, like to blame the other. The easiest thing to uh, do when you've got a horrific tragedy of three young girls, beautiful kids, being murdered, uh, to see that being used to propagate these messages of hatred just I, I find astonishing. But you see people actually, you know, buying into that. And I'm afraid we've got to make sure we say no to that and stand up to that and challenge those sorts of views. And, and do you think the government has described what's going on correctly? You know, there are lots of people um, who are saying you need to have said more clearly that this was racist and Islamophobic rather than just thuggery. Because thuggery doesn't quite cover what's going on. Well, look, I'm quite clear, and I think, I think both Kira and Yvette have been quite clear. Uh, I'm quite clear. This is racist. Uh, there has been violence. There has been hatred being uh, uh, spread. Also, I think some people have been, uh, you know, sold the disinformation and disinformation. I mean, you can tell a lie on social media, uh, you know, uh, forget, you know, uh, minutes. It takes seconds to just, you know, and the way the algorithms work, uh, clickbait, uh, if they're negative messages said by certain people, they just fly. And we know the consequence of this. What's the consequence? A hostel being set on fire. What's the consequence? A police car being set on fire. What's the consequence? Police officers have been injured. In London yesterday, I spoke to Muslims, lawyers, um, people working in health practices, uh, petrified and scared. I spoke to my own nephews and nieces and said, please don't go out, go out in the evening because I worry about your safety. This is London in 2024, for goodness sake. So practically, what can you do to reach the kinds of kids who end up being the thugs on the street? Well, what we're funding from City Hall, we invest in projects to work at an early stage with young people to give them the resilience to reject later on when social media or a charismatic leader or somebody else may try and send them on a certain path. They can reject it because they know that actually, you know, multiculturalism isn't all evil. What I, I find a source of interest but also pride is in those parts of our country where there's the greatest diversity and there's the most mixing and mingling between white people and those who are diverse, there's the least trouble. Because they know people like me, people like you aren't the boogeyman. They know we're not a drain on public services. They've mixed and mingled with refugees. Many of the teachers, uh, doctors and so forth, may be informal refugees. That These problems are happening in those parts of the country where there may be less diversity, but there are problems with lack of public services, uh, not decent G facilities, not decent uh, schools, not decent investment over, you know, 14, 15 years. That's why it's really important to understand those concerns and address them and don't leave a vacuum for the far right to occupy. Do you think we need to be looking at the whole question of toxic masculinity, Andrew Tate, all those sorts of messages, you know, and how this plays into that? Because there seems to be like a new ecosystem now where you've got that going on online, it's amplified by people like Nigel Farage, you know, the right-wing media, and it's kind of all growing as a result. I spend a lot of time with young people, and I think one of the biggest fears I have, and the biggest issues that's not being addressed, is the source of information young people now get is uh, unchecked. It can be on their phone, it can be TikTok, it, it can be, uh, you mentioned Andrew Tate. And the way the algorithms work is, you get similar sorts of messages from similar sorts of views and there's no challenge. And you're going down this uh, you know, Alice in Wonderland hole where it's just one dimensional and one view. And we've got to recognise uh, that's one of the reasons why you're seeing the numbers you're seeing across the country. Because, you know, whether it's uh, Stephen, you know, Yaxley Lennon or whether it's Andrew Tate uh, or whether it's somebody else spreading misinformation, they get more of this sort of stuff, which means they rock up at these sort of protests. And just finally, I mean, you know, what we saw last night was lots of people coming out to defend their communities. What as the mayor do you want people to do when you hear about this? Should you go out onto the streets? Look, I, I live through uh, the NF, the National Front, and the BNP. Uh, a source of pride for me was my white friends coming to my support and going on marches with me to stand up against the NF and the BNP. We thought they were gone. Uh, there's a new generation called the EDL. So these iterations that are around, that's why we can't ever be complacent. We've always got to be vigilant. My daughters, for the first time in their lives, are scared because of the colour of their skin. Right? They're scared because they look like Muslims. We thought that was behind us with our generation. And that's why we can't, we can't be uh, uh, complacent. And that's why it's really important. You know, we aren't smug about, you know, listen, this can happen in London. London is perfect because it could happen in London. And that's why we've got to carry on engaging with, you know, you know uh, communities in London to make sure they understand there's a reason why diversity in our city is a strength, not a weakness. Sadiq Khan, thank you very much.
Excellent. Well, yet again, ministers are at their emergency COBRA meeting in Downing Street tonight. Our senior political correspondent, Paul McNamara, is in Westminster. Paul, tell us more. Yeah, one message of the last week, Matt, has been that words matter as much as actions, and they have repercussions. In the last few hours, a councillor from Kent has been arrested for the words he spoke at the counter-protest in Walthamstow last night. Ricky Jones was a Labour councillor. He was filmed saying about the far right, quote, they are disgusting Nazi fascists and we need to cut all their throats and get rid of them all. Labour suspended Mr Jones as soon as they were aware of the video. This afternoon he was arrested by the Met Police and held on suspicion of encouraging murder and for an offence under the Public Order Act. When it comes to words online, we've had yet more tweets from ex-owner Elon Musk goading the Prime Minister, one which he since deleted, but not before it racked up nearly two million views. The problem for Mr uh, Musk about this one tweet was he was retweeting a, it was fake news. It was the mock-up of a Telegraph article claiming that people convicted of rioting could be sent to, quote, uh, detainment camps in the Falkland Islands. But, of course, remember, all of this is at a time when post-Southport, the rhetoric from government is that they will be clamping down on the spread of misinformation. I caught up with the policing minister, Diana Johnson, earlier on and asked her about the responsibility of social media platforms. But I started by asking her if she thought that last night may have been a turning point and things might now calm down. I am cautiously hopeful. The Home Secretary, myself, the Prime Minister, we're all being kept up to date with intelligence and about what's expected over the next few days. But that's a matter for the police then to risk assess uh, each piece of intelligence that they get. The online safety bill still doesn't come into force for a good long while to come. Ofcom yesterday wrote to social mm. media companies saying, look, there's no reason why you can't start yeah. enacting now what we hope you will in a few months. But isn't it the truth? They just don't have to, and actually, they're not acting soon enough. Well, two things. One is, if criminal um, offences are being committed on these social media posts now, calling people to violence, calling people to incite racial hatred, those are criminal offences and they need to be dealt with by the social media companies. They need to be removed now. That's, but are they? That's are the social media companies dealing with this? There is some movement on that, but of course I want to see more. This is coming down the track at them. Get ahead of it. Deal with it now. I think that the public would expect that of responsible social media companies. In other words, while you're saying this, we've got the owner of one of those social media companies taunting the Prime Minister. X aren't taking this seriously, are they? I'm not getting into what Elon Musk has said or not said. That's irrelevant. The whole of government recognises that there are issues that we will need to address in the coming weeks and months around how we engage with those social media, media companies. What about some prominent people on those platforms? In the early days, we had Nigel Farage tweeting. He later blamed the police for not clarifying the situation sooner. What do you think of a, an MP, a Member of Parliament, saying such things, writing such things on social media and the effect it has on what's happened over the last two weeks? All MPs have a responsibility to be measured and calm. Do you think Nigel Farage has been measured and calm? I don't think he's being measured and calm and I think that you're in a leadership position as a Member of Parliament. The country has gone through a very difficult few days. We need to be very careful that we are not spreading or amplifying uh, misinformation and disinformation, which clearly in that case uh, w was actually uh, the case. Are you looking at banning rioters from football matches? Options are being considered. Uh, it seems to me that football clubs and rugby clubs probably do not want to have people who cause criminal violence on the streets of the communities where those uh, clubs are based. And that that sounds like a yes. That's certainly a matter for football clubs and rugby clubs if they want to take that action. But it, just from my perspective, it's something that, that should be looked at, yes. Donna Johnson, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.